The city of Canals lies in the northern bay of the Adriatic Sea, opposite the Istria Peninsula, from where the stone and wood necessary for building was shipped. The city can be approached from the direction of Mestre by train or car, or from the direction of Punta Sabioni by sea. It's also part of Venice's appeal that there's no traffic in the city. So our car has to be parked on Piazzale Roma, near the train station, from where we can get to the heart of the city on foot or by gondola. Those arriving by ship, however, can catch a glimpse of the red brick belfry of the Campanile and St. Mark's Square at its foot from afar, which Napoleon called the most beautiful salon of Europe. The most well-known buildings of the city are located on St. Mark's Square, in Italian Piazza San Marco, the domed arch St. Mark's Cathedral, the clock tower, the stone filigree Doge's Palace, the Bridge of Sighs, and the Belfry made Venice the capital of romance, the dream of honeymooners, the yearned-for destination of millions. St. Mark's Square actually contains two squares, the 175-meter-long, increasingly widening piazza and the narrow piazzetta, joining it at a right angle. When arriving from the direction of the sea, we can catch sight of those two granite pillars first that were looted by the Venetian army during the First Crusade. The dragon killer statue represents Saint Theodore. Venice's symbol, the winged lion, is standing on the other. One of the three pillars fell into the sea when being unloaded from the ship from where it was never retrieved. Originally, two gemstones glittered in the eye of the lion, but these had disappeared by the time the statue transported by Napoleon to Paris returned to its place. Inhabitants say, Venice is unique. Venezia è unica. Painters, photographers, filmmakers, poets and writers have all tried to unravel its appeal. A whole pantheon of authors has devoted sonnets and odes, essays and novels to this city that touches everybody, whether they want it or not. The Doge's Palace, called Palazzo Ducale in Italian, stands as a symbol of secular strength next to St. Mark's Cathedral, incarnating the medieval power of the Church. Doge Angelo Participazio placed the center of the executive branch to the marketplace in the 800s. This was a castle defended by canals, the basement walls of which can still be seen in the treasury of the Basilica. Doge Ziani built a palace in the place of the castle, demolished by the Great Fire, in the hope of outshining the magnificent patrician houses bordering the Canale Grande. By 1304, the Great Council had outgrown the building, which didn't have a hall of sufficient capacity. After ominous precedents, the wing looking over the sea was built, which connected to the Byzantine Palace of Ziani in the direction of the Piazzetta. Its first master builder was taken away by the plague, while his successor was convicted of conspiracy and executed. In 1419, another fire made it necessary to erect a new part of building in the place of the existing old wing. In 1577, the thought of designing a completely new building occurred, and finally, fortunately, the opinion of the chief architect Antonio de Ponte, who also designed the Rialto Bridge, was accepted. During reconstruction, the building received its Renaissance exterior and interior ornaments still visible today, on which Veronese, Tiziano, and Tintoretto have also worked. Tibor Veit wrote the following about Venice. After the uniform style of the frontage, the overall varied picture of the courtyard is surprising, in which the early Renaissance, even Baroque style, mixes with Gothic shapes, and one is drawn into an Oriental feeling by the cupola of the basilica facing inside. The prevailing tone is of Quattrocento, because the eastern wing, looking over the Rio, was composed by the remarkably talented Antonio Rizzo, with the richly decorated marble patterns of the Lombard Renaissance, only the first floor archway has retained pointed arches. The Gothic wings above the Circologgia show their bare, glowing red brick walls that enhance the scenic effect. In the so-called clock front, Renaissance and pointed arch forms already merge with Baroque-like busyness. The modest suite of the Doges was established in a hidden part of the back wing. The palace rather concentrates on larger halls, such as the Voting Hall, the Sala de Maggior Consiglio, and the Chamber of the Great Council. 
Since Doja Marina Faliero endeavored to procure autocracy in 1354, the power of the Doges was curtailed significantly. Compatriot residents of St. Mark weren't real prevailing princes, only presidents of an aristocratic republic living in a golden cage. Actual power was practiced by the Concilio de Dieci, the frightful Council of Ten. I stood in Venice on the Bridge of Sighs, a palace and a prison on each hand. I saw from out the wave her structures rise, as from the stroke of the enchanter's wand. This was the poem in which Byron called Antonia de Ponte's structure the Bridge of Sighs. Italians claimed this romantic name right away. The bridge connects the judgment hall of the Doge's palace with the prison built on the opposite side of the canal. These were the cells where Casanova also served his term. The lead prison, which became intolerably hot in the sun, and the basements, which flooded at the time of high tide, are likewise the brainchildren of future pulp fiction, just as the trap door of the bridge through which the prisoners would fall into the canal. The prison inspired romantic writers and novelists such as Eugène Sue, Ponson de Terre, and even Victor Hugo. When St. Mark's corpse was brought to Venice from the Egyptian Alexandria in 828, and he was made the patron saint of the city, it became necessary to erect a church deserving of his name. The first church built beside the Doge's castle was replaced with a more grandiose one in 1063. The Apostolian Church in Constantinople served as model, as can be seen by the five Islamic-inspired onion domes. By using the remains of the predecessor, a Byzantine-style basilica with Greek cross layout was established, the walls of which were bare for the time being. In fact, the characteristic feature of Byzantine-Venetian architecture is that method of tiling in which the division of pillars and arches is replaced by the beauty of marble and mosaic surfaces. Venetian merchants traveling through the fabulous East brought home more than beautiful marble, pillars, statues, and ornaments to embellish their church. There were also alabaster, lapis lazuli, jasper, and other semi-precious stones. An art historian wrote the following. The caves of the five huge arches gradually reveal their treasures, golden mosaic tiles and hundreds of pillars. The veins of the pale green marble covering, the tissue composed of leaves, tendrils, animals, angel and human figures of the marble coverings emerge from that with which the main entrance is decorated. Ethereal pinnacles above the ledge and marble foam from the mosaic gilded arches running among them splash up to the feet of the haloed saints standing on the lancet arches. The ornamental clock tower, the Orologio, was built in 1496. Two naked giants ring the bells with their hammers above the winged lion on top of the tower. The large face of the clock shows the course of the sun and the moon and the signs of the zodiac. The figures of the three kings stand out above on the two sides of the Madonna statue. In the 1960s, French novelist Michel Butor described St. Mark's Square as follows. People under the arcades, people window shopping, turn around, come and go, walk from shadow to sunlight. People drink coffee at the tables of coffee shops, listen to the babbling waltzes and tangos of bands, open their newspapers, lean over postcards, load film in their cameras, stir the sugar in their cups, thumbing their guidebooks, counting their liras. People flow like a flood, groups form and disperse themselves, look for a seat, flop down on a chair, fan themselves, smile, boasting of what they've bought and discovered. Famous pigeons of St. Mark's Square waddle at the feet of the varied crowd, streaming on the square. In his besiege of Crete, Admiral Dondolo managed to capture the homing pigeons of the Genoan supporting defense. They brought the pigeons here out of gratitude after having won the battle and fed them from public money, so it's no wonder that they've proliferated at this rate. The spur of the piazza running along the northern side of the church was named after Pope John XXIII. Baldassara Cosa possessed the throne of St. Peter under this name between 1410 and 1415. His memorial plaque stands in front of the northern side of San Marco. The heritage of the East can be discerned on this facade. The relief of Alexander the Great and the Oji arched flower gate are especially beautiful. 
Unlike other European countries, the belfries weren't organic parts of the churches in medieval Italy. The belfry of San Marco, the Campanile, is also a separate building, which also served as a lighthouse for the sailors of the lagoons. Instead of a weathercock, a gilded angel rotates atop it. The nearly 100-meter-high square tower has remained unchanged since it was built in the 10th century. Although the reason is unknown yet today, on a sunny summer morning of 1902, the tower collapsed and the Logetta was buried beneath the ruins. It was considered a miracle that nobody was hurt in the accident and the building was reconstructed comera dovera, that is, as it was, where it was. Though looking up, it seems hard to believe, the loggia of the observation deck is scarcely higher than the middle of the tower, exactly 54 meters above the level of the square. It was established by Pietro Buon, the master builder of the basilica in the 1500s. In absence of radio, the bells managed the lives of Venetians. This is from where they knew that the Senate was in session, and this called the patricians to the chamber. Marango called the workers to work, while Nona indicated noon, and the bells informed people of death sentences, the doge's death, and were also rung in case of fire. Today, not having any other role, they notify the passing of time. According to the official standpoint, the most beautiful view of Venice is from the Tower of San Giorgio Maggiore, but the sight from here isn't to be discounted either. The piazza with the chairs and parasols of the Florian and all the other coffee shops, surrounded by arcades, spreads directly at the foot of the tower. A crowd of tourists and pigeons congregate in front of the Doge's palace. The winged lion standing on the pillar seems to dwarf from this height. Gondolas swing in front of the ever-busy pier. In front of Hotel Daniele, Vaporetto's dock, while farther in the direction of the park, larger boats can be seen. Opposite, San Giorgio Maggiore Island can be seen with the dome church bearing the same name. Slightly to the right stands the familiar-looking Santa Maria della Salute church, the customs office building beside it, and the mouth of the Canella Grande behind. The quay running behind St. Mark's Square and the arsenal is called Riva delle Schiavoni. A long time ago, colorful Chiojian fishing boats and Dalmatian sailing boats docked here, but nowadays we can sail out to the islands of the lagoon from here, and this is where ships departing from Punta Sabioni and the Lido arrive. Virtually the first thing the disembarking passenger glimpses is the Bridge of Size, of which the best photographs can be taken from the Paglia Bridge. One of the most popular photo subjects is the bridge with gondolas rowing beneath. Since most foreigners set foot on land here, this is the place where the city's famous luxury hotels are located. Forget modern concrete, glass cubes, these are established, old-fashioned hotels. The Excelsior, Londra Palace, and especially the Daniele were already concepts at the time of the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy. Verdi, Alfred Musset, Georges Sand, and Hemingway all stayed here. The hotel has already outgrown its original building, the Palazzo Bernardi of the 15th century. Today, the newer building next to it also belongs to the hotel. In front of the Daniele, street sellers are swarming. The gondoliers shout out to passing tourists, and of course, here anything costs twice as much as one corner further. After the unification of Italy, Venice couldn't remain without a statue of Victor Emmanuel. The pedestal of the bronze equestrian monument by Ettore Ferrari features the relief of the Battle of Palestra, while the accompanying figures symbolize a prisoner and the liberated Venice. As early as the Middle Ages, various traders and street vendors were already a customary part of the picture of the city of canals. Considering that, their present today doesn't seem anachronistic especially because the largest part of the goods they offer do have at least something to do with Venice. For example, they sell straw hats similar to those of the gondoliers or beach bags and t-shirts with Venice written on them. The most artistic things are diverse masks made for carnival. Their production has become a genuine artistic industrial branch. If we're lucky, we can happen into a small side street where we can have a look at a tiny little workshop where the masks are being made by hand. Singing Elated lights and arcs float out in the night. The sound of harp rings in my soul, and deeply moved, my lips rumble a barcarola song, gladly quavering, quietly, wonder who hears it. These are the words of Nietzsche, but similar poems about gondolas fill volumes. 
The seaside church of Santa Maria della Pieta was built by Massari in the 18th century. Its ceiling frescoes were painted by Tiepolo. An old Baedeker travel guide tempted its readers with the following. There's no other city in the world, the mere name of which would have such an inspiring effect on human imagination of artists and everyday people alike as that of Venice. The long line of stone-laced palaces along the streets which are not covered with asphalt and granite stones, but the silky bluish ripples of babbling water. The city of silence, from which the noise of streets is missing, for fear of awakening the town's spirit, dreaming of the past and the wandering reverie of foreigners going there on a pilgrimage. The skimming row of picturesque gondolas, the magnificence of churches spearing up before us from the past centuries, gloomy and graceful marble palaces stones talking about their pasts, and a treasury of one of the greatest eras of human art. This is Venice, the city of imagination, dreams, and last but not least, lovers. The Canal Grande, the Great Canal, is the main artery of the city. Due to its reversed S shape, we feel that it's present everywhere in Venice. It's 3.8 kilometers long, its width varying between 30 and 70 meters, and with a depth of 4 meters on the average. The hundred or so palaces lining up on its banks look like a living exhibition of Venice's architecture floating in front of our eyes. The only means of transport on the Canale Grande is boat, since there are hardly any sidewalks in front of the buildings. If we'd like to have a better look or photograph them, it's only possible to do from a gondola or water bus, or we can get off at any landing place and gain foothold on the square in front of any church. The palazzos were built between the 11th and 18th centuries. At first, the Byzantine Romanesque style was prominent, then from the middle of the 18th century, the Venetian branch of Gothic art conquered. Renaissance became widespread by the end of the 15th century. Two centuries after the Baroque style appeared, and it can be said that by the beginning of the 18th century, the picture of the Canal Grande, as is visible today, had evolved. Venetian diplomacy had a determining role already in the early Middle Ages, and visiting foreigner notabilities conveyed the reputation of its beauty and wealth throughout the world. Imagine how this Venice with water streets and marble palaces could have affected uncouth armored knights. The Byzantine palaces with marble loggias and the harbor, the motley whirl of the Rialto, the already paved routes of the metropolis counting more than 100,000 inhabitants. The banks of the Canal de Grande were lined with patrician palaces, and we still admire those which have remained. The beauty of Cadoro is legendary. It faithfully preserves its Byzantine past, its marble mosaic evoking the patterns of oriental carpets. Palazzo Cavalli, considered the most illustrious artwork of Quattrocento, was renovated by Baron Franchetti at the end of the 19th century. Today, the headquarters of the Savings Bank of Veneto Province is located in this building. The first settlers brought stones and soil to the tiny islands. Then to keep the water from washing it away, they surrounded it with a dam woven of twigs and reinforced by piles. As the population grew and later became wealthy, they started to find possibilities to lay foundations for larger buildings, cutting down slender pines on the slopes of the neighboring Istrian peninsula. They weren't even trimmed. The trunks were driven into the earth upside down and could cling to the mud of the bottom. The piles were sunken seven to eight meters deep in the already solid sand and clay layer. Their gaps were filled with stones and, if needed, set with tar. Limestone plates also brought from Istria were laid over this, since this prevents the corroding effect of salty seawater. Churches and public buildings were then built on the limestone plates, wooden and mainly loam houses standing among them. Stone houses multiplied from the 11th century. The substructure also determined the building method. Therefore, the Venetian buildings had pillars and loggias and were more ethereal and lighter than other structures of that age. The Santa Maria della Saluta Church stands on the Dorso Duro Promontory, catty corner to St. Mark's Square, at the mouth of the Canal Grande. The huge double-dome building is one of the most beautiful Baroque churches in the world. 
In 1630, about 50,000 people died in the epidemic of the Great Plague. After the epidemic had passed, the city built the Santa Maria della Salute in gratitude. The weight of the monumental marble building is borne by 1,200,000 oaken piles. The generous plan of Baldassare Longhena is quite unusual. The layout connects an octagonal dome space with another. The cupola of the dome crowned with a small light tower is held by eight scrolls. The church has six fronts. Its eastern side is sealed with a small dome. A monumental flight of stairs leads up to the main entrance. The building is partially made of Istrian stone, partly of marmorino. These are bricks covered with marble dust, which lends the walls a special glitter. Longhena formally designed two palaces on the bank of the Canale Grande, the Palazzo Rezzonico and the Palazzo Pesaro. These gave him the possibility to create his masterwork. Each of his works of art shows the influence of Sansovino and Palladio. The inner space is nobly simple and proportional. The dome sectioned with windows projects present light on the central space and the aisles, but the high altar of the large presbytery falls into mysterious twilight. From the statues of the high altar, also designed by Longhena, the one titled The Holy Virgin Expels the Plague is the most spectacular. Several pictures can be found in the church from Tiziano, and it was he who painted the ceiling fresco too. Opposite the entrance, we find Tintoretto's wedding at Cana, while in the vestry, Tullio Lombardo's relief fascinates us. The Doja led a procession to the church on the 21st of November every year, commemorating the passing of the plague, starting from St. Mark's Square over the boat bridge. This anniversary is still celebrated today. Next to the church, Dogana de Mar, the long stretching building of the Customs House, is wedged in between the Canale Grande and the Giudecca Canal. Above its small tower, two atlases hold a gilded globe on which the goddess of fortune shows the direction of the wind. The wooden bridge of the Canale Grande spans the canal in front of the Accademia. The Gallery dell'Accademia is a perfect example of Venetian art. We find the victorious five centuries of painting from Trecento to Settecento in 24 rooms. On the other side of the wooden bridge is the Campo San Vitale Church. The church was designed by a disciple of Palladio. Behind its white marble facade, there are often fine art exhibitions. Vidal, as the Venetians call it, hasn't functioned as a place of worship for quite some time. Its side naves have been rebuilt in a strange manner into small flats for rent. Campo Morosini is one of the largest squares in the city. It's always full of tourists with cameras heading from the Accademia to the Rialto. Mostly foreigners sit here in the shade of big parasols. After long hours of sightseeing, it's good to just sit and enjoy a cup of genuine Italian cappuccino and a sandwich. This is still the downtown area, the San Marco district, but if we wander into some narrow little Calais, we can take a peek at how the locals live. At the foot of the bridge, the gondoliers snatch a siesta with their caps over their eyes. In the tiny little bars, blue-collar workers, boatsmen, sales staff, and other laborers take a break with a glass of wine. They spend the afternoon arguing about the football match, even out shouting the sports reporter. Wonderful smells float out from the small workshops of bakers and confectioners. In the deeps of the candle shops, we're taken back decades in time. Even today, tobacco is sold exclusively in Sale Tabaki or tobacconists. The mailman is making his rounds in a boat, just like the trash collector or the pizza delivery. A statue of the writer Niccolo Tomaseo stands in the middle of the square. It was he who was one of the major leaders of the 1848 revolution. San Stefano, a church in early Gothic style with three naves, is located on a small square of the same name. Built during the Trecento era, the ornamental main gate of the church resembles Porta della Carta. Several people who were important in the life of the city have been buried in the middle and side naves. 
Andrea Cantarini and Doja Francesco Morosini lie here since the public budget didn't allow for a gravestone. Ancient palaces, closed in deep magical dreams, are silent. Before us, gondolas swim on like rueful thoughts in the nocturnal haze. From the towers, an ave resounds. The domes speak to us, but guard their secrets by the ancient palaces swimming in the canals. These lines by Rainer Maria Rilke describe a quiet Venice in off-season. Théophile Gautier writes the following. How entertaining is it for a non-Venetian to become enmeshed in the inextricable labyrinth? We get in and out at 15 or 20 tiny lanes, Calais, 10 canals, and just as many bridges, and all of a sudden, we stumble into a dark dead-end street from where we can barely find our way out. These jaunts allow us a glance into Venice's hidden secrets and endless string of picturesque attractions. Istvan Vosch was provided a similar experience by the Labyrinth of Calais, Campos, and Rios. This maze taking us into a dead-end street, even during the daytime, many narrow, suspicious alleys, and suddenly the sea and cheerfulness, the extravagant expanse of St. Mark's Square. San Jose, a Baroque church of which only the belfry has remained, was built by the Fini family on the one-time site of a Roman sanctuary. The works of Alessandro Tremillon are overly ornamental and hectic and are almost grotesquely Baroque. The church of Santa Maria Zobenigo provides a nicer side of the Baroque style. The Barbara family had it built by Giuseppe Sardi. Vieni la barca e pronta. The barge is ready for you, waiting for you. The breeze and the air are gentle. The babble in the sky are longing only for love. Barcarola, the song sung by the gondoliers, became a separate genre. Naturally, today not every gondolier sings, but if he does, he sings a hit from Gianni Morandi, Celentano, or Toto Contugno. Gondolas are exclusively typical of Venice, and Venice would be unimaginable without them. The name originates from the Greek word kondu. We don't know when the first gondola was made. Its first mention in writing derives from 1094. The graceful boats are 11 meters long and only 1 meter and 40 centimeters wide. Their slim body chambers and their right side is 24 centimeters shorter. Its prow is called porova, its stern, where the gondolier rows, is the popa. The six-toothed, halberd-like metal plate jutting up on the prow represents the six districts of the city, the Sestiers. Two armchairs stand in the middle, but in case of a larger family or group, four sidelong jump seats are also available. The gondolas used to be different in color. In fact, they were even expressly varied until the Council of Ten prescribed the uniform black color in order to avoid exaggerated luxury. Gondoliers gladly decorate their boats with all kinds of copper or other ornaments, velvet cushions, and fringes. Touts are crawling for passengers in front of hotels or tourist sites. Gondola, signore, la gondola! Today, a total of 500 gondolas roam the waterways. A single round tour with a gondola costs approximately 25% more than a three-day Vaporetto season ticket. Once again, the words of Tibor fight. The experiences of wandering in the Calais can be more strongly felt while gondoliering in the small rios. We see green moss on the lower edges of the houses, windows, water gates covered with grids or solid iron plates. Some of them yawn darkly as if concealing long past sins. We slowly slide on top of the swaying reflection of colorful walls. Arches of graceful bridges float above us, and as a vision, 
The loggia tracery of an ogival palace swims toward us. Arched arcades, then a Lombard palace with pink, ochre, and green marble inlays line our way. The reflected rays conjure rocking light mosaics on the fraying walls of private houses. The regatta rowing competition is held in Venice in September. The event has been held on the Canale Grande every year since 1315. This was the ancestor of all regattas. The rowing teams of Italian universities follow the tradition on Lake Garda, but the Oxford and Cambridge rowing competitions are also patterned after the Venetian model. The competition is always preceded by a large parade. Still today, notabilities watch the events from a grandstand richly decorated with flowers, while the masses watch the rowers, who are dressed in period costumes, from the balconies and windows of palaces and the wooden bridge of the Accademia. The neighborhood of the Rialto boasts the most ancient and most valuable buildings of the Canale Grande. The Cornaro family gained its wealth from sugar trading. They gave Venice four doges and numerous cardinals and a queen to Cyprus. Caterina Cornaro, the future queen, was born in the house standing in the place of this palace in 1454. Her exceptional beauty was retained for us by the masterpiece of Tiziano. The two oldest houses of the Sestiera of Byzantine origin are the Casa Bragadin Favretto and the Palazzo Segredo Morosini. Bishop St. Gerard, who died as a martyr while converting Hungarians to Christianity, was born in the latter. He's commemorated by Gellert Hill and the monument standing on it in Budapest. The Palazzo Michiel della Colonna got its name from the pillars traditionally brought from the Crusades and built into the palace. The Dabrusa Palace, beside it, was the ancient nest of the doges of the Crusades that was reconstructed in Gothic style after the fire. The Ca de Mosta also retains Byzantine heritage. Alvisa de Mosta, a medieval sailor and the explorer of the African Cape Verde, was born here. The famous lodging house called White Lion operated on the first floor of the building for two centuries. A grandstand is set up in front of the Palazzo Labia at the time of the regatta. Byzantine-style palaces determine the cityscape even today, the characteristic of which is their marble covering and the arcades and windows demonstrating graceful slender shapes. The arcades are oddly different in size. The outside openings are always narrower than the middle, and the arcades of the upper loggias differ from the ones on the first floor. An upper loggia row is called pergola, indicating that the higher, more protected story can be more freely open than the first floor. Three years after the exploration of America, French ambassador Philippe de Comines wrote his experiences in this way. The Canale Grande is the most beautiful route in the world. Houses are very high, built of precious marble. The old ones are totally colorful and have been standing for centuries. The newer ones are decorated with Istrian white marble and porphyry fronts. Gilded rooms inside with fireplaces richly carved from marble, very splendid, gleaming in vivid colors. This is the most glorious city I have ever seen. Marlena de Blasi writes in her novel entitled A Thousand Days in Venice, Perhaps no one will ever come to know Venice as imagined, as recalled in an episode in a dream. Venice is the fantasy world of all of us. Water, light, color, scent, escape, disguise, and licentiousness twist into a golden string and are woven into a gown that it then drags along its stones in the daytime. Boats pass through the white marble arch of the Rialto, spanning 28 meters. Tiziano Aspetti's reliefs portraying St. Theodore and St. Mark can be seen from the water. In the words of Percy Bysshe Shelley, who settled in Italy, leaving England behind, underneath day's azure eyes, ocean's nursling, Venice lies, a peopled labyrinth of walls, column, tower, dome, and spire shine like obelisks of fire, pointing with inconstant motion from the altar of dark ocean to the sapphire-tinted sky. He wasn't the only one to leave England and come here. 
Numerous Italian and foreign artists visited or lived here, from Dante to Petrarca to Goethe and Thomas Mann, from Casanova to D'Annunzio, from Hemingway to Ezra Pound, and from Nietzsche to Wordsworth, from Vivaldi to Browning, and from Wagner to Stravinsky. The Baroque marble façade of Chiesa di San Eustachio, otherwise called Chiesa di San Ste, was completed in 1711, and its interior contains paintings by Piazzetta and Tiapello, as well as an interesting exhibition of inventions by Leonardo da Vinci. The location of the exhibition is unusual, as are the materials, consisting not of his graphic work or paintings, nor architectural plans, but of the extraordinary machines which were far ahead of their time. One of the great virtues of Dan Brown's bestseller, The Da Vinci Code, is that with it, he brought the attention of everyone to anything that is remotely related to Leonardo. Probably this was the power that initiated this exhibition as well. All 30 models on display work, or are at least operational, so this is more than just an exhibition for the eyes. We can see crossbows and other implements of war, as well as models related to hydrodynamics. The camera obscura is also an invention of Leonardo, which contributed to the development of photography, but he also planned machines of warfare. In fact, perhaps the idea for the very first tank originated in the mind of this genius. A hang glider, helicopter, propeller, and other flying machines are also on display. We know that Leonardo never tried these out, but it's not at all certain that Hollywood was the only place that the only life-sized airplane was made. Remember Bruce Willis' film, Hudson Hawk? The wooden bicycle is also life-size, and we could probably even try it out, if there were enough room. We can also see that water pump, which was created according to the principles of Archimedes. An automatic hammer is run by water energy, while the cog-driven operation is made easier by the gears. The master used a ratchet to prevent rewinding, also one of his inventions. Next to the Stai and the Rococo House of Goldsmiths, there's a Tiapello exhibition. Venice, as the center of trade between East and West, soaked up something from the exoticism and colors of the East. Because Venice is also the city of colors. The dark tone of other cities transcends to the sparkling colors of the rainbow here. The shadows of buildings don't get lost in the grayness of asphalt, but reflect on the greenish water of the canals. This reflection is like candlelight, enhancing or washing contours away as flickering light spots vibrate on walls and stones. The leaded silver of arches sparkles in the volatile medium of water and air. The marble of Byzantine buildings vibrate. White stone laces are created on the facades by the ogives. The painters of Venice were always inspired by the ever-renewing colorful city. The oriental mosaics of St. Mark's, the gold of the sun setting above the sea, the fog floating above the canals, the red-hot scarlet of dusk. In strong contrast with the neighboring train station, this church was designed for the barefoot Carmelites by the city's best Baroque architect, Longena. The front remained entirely unscathed, but its interior was almost entirely demolished by Austrian aerial bombs in World War I. Every incongruous monument is extraordinarily striking in a city of such a unique style. 
such as the train station erected in the 1950s, the Stazione Ferroviaria Santa Lucia. Venice has been connected to the mainland by the railway bridge since 1846. The San Simeone Piccolo is the first site for tourists exiting the train station. The creation of Scafarotto excels with its high green dome and its neoclassical entrance. The bridge opposite the church has been spanning the canal since 1934. To quote Goethe's Italianische Reise of 1786, Towards evening I explore, again without a guide, the remoter quarters of the city. All the bridges are provided with stairs so that gondolas and even larger boats can pass under their arches. I tried to find my way in and out of the labyrinth by myself, asking nobody the way and taking my directions only from the points of the compass. Of course, it's possible to get out of this, but it's unbelievable what a mess entangles itself here. Cale means path in Italian. Sidewalks that are as wide as an arm's breadth are called by this term. Salizzata is a cala covered with granite. Ramo is a dead end or alley, while Sotoportico is an arcaded street leading to an inner courtyard. Fondamenta is a sidewalk running along canals. Keys are called rivas, and the filled one-time canals, rio terras. Most of the squares are just campielos, that is, squarelet. The larger ones are called campos. The name piazza, meaning square everywhere else in Italy, here refers exclusively to Piazza San Marco. In the square behind Scuola di San Rocco, a frari, famous for Tintoretto's 56 large, dramatic, glowing paintings, is located. It's a real mecca of Renaissance art enthusiasts. The Santa Maria Gloriosa de Frari, or as everybody calls it, Frari, is the third most significant church of Venice. When St. Francis of Assisi traveled to the Holy Land through Venice, his followers, the Brown Friars, were on his trail. Doge Tiapolo authorized to found a modest church and an accompanying monastery. What's more, he even sponsored it. The construction of the huge Gothic church was decided on by his successor, Doge Francesco Dandolo. The donations of the Corner family also supported the establishment of the church. The Frari is not typically Venetian, but is a typically Italian church. It was constructed with raw brick walls, arches rising high, and an inner frame. The long stretching chapel series and the apse windows are typically Gothic. The huge inner space is held by pillars of two meters in diameter, decorated with masterpieces of Tiziano, Bellini, and Tiepolo. Next to Frari Zanipolo stands the other pantheon of Venice. Several doges are buried here, and Tiziano himself also rests here, his tomb made by an artist comparable to him, Canova. The circular structure with loges and a Renaissance yard behind the church is the old monastery. Its cloister surrounds a yard with an ornamental fountain with antique mood. The monastery serves a different purpose now than its original function long ago. Today, the invaluable archives of Serenissima are kept here. Government contracts, diplomatic documents, reports, letters from the Byzantine emperors, the popes, and the sultans, legal files, laws, and other documents denoting the history of the city-state. A total of 600 million pages. The most famous native of Venice is the great traveler Marco Polo. Not only a house, but a group of houses of the rich merchant family stands in the city. The explorer was born in this early Gothic building complex built around the ancient dwelling connected with the Soto Portico. The boy was 15 when he traveled to China with his father and brother following the caravan routes of Venetian merchants. The great Khan took him into his confidence and Marco Polo carried out commercial and diplomatic assignments for him. After coming home, he was captured during the naval battle fought with Genoa. He wrote his travel experiences while in prison. Among others, this famous travel diary passed around in handwritten form all over Europe encouraged Columbus to set forth on his great journey 
trusting the theory about the roundness of the Earth. The facade of San Toma standing in the neighborhood of the Frari is unusually empty, the relief of the beautiful Madonna adorning the sidewalls. The patina of stones, pillars, statues, and fountains worn by water and sun, and the Byzantine mosaic's dull surface, the rigid iron gates of the prison, and the many shiny creatures of the vivid Baroque imagination, snow-white marble palaces and sinking houses, narrow alleys, and the infinite sea, the harmonious mixture glitter and passing. This is Venice. The disadvantage of building on the sea is that while Pisa has only one leaning tower, Venice has dozens. Due to the slow sinking of the city, the towers of San Stefano, San Giorgio de Grechi, and San Pietro have tilted. Even the Tower of Frari seems to be leaning. The San Apunal Church was built in the 11th century in honor of a saint from Ravenna. A relief commemorating General Vittorio Capello was placed in the rose window of the reconstructed red brick building. This work, in remembrance of the general of the war against the Turks, was created by Antonio Rizzo. The crucifix has been removed from the church, thus its religious function has been terminated. Today, it's used for occasional art exhibitions. San Giacometto di Rialto is the city's oldest church and was built in the 5th century. Later, it was reconstructed several times and it's a remembrance of the Byzantine style with its ground plan in the shape of a Greek cross. The enormous clock on its exterior wall was added in a later century. The main altar has a statue of Saint Jacob, for whom the church was named. Beneath the arcades opposite the church is a granite column originating from Egypt. The regulations of the market were chiseled into it and supposedly the traders not adhering to them were also hung here. The stairs are held by a mishappen figure, a Gothic gargoyle, or it could also be the hunchback of Notre Dame, but it's the Il Goba di Rialto. The statue was created by Pietro di Salo on the basis of an old legend. One of the two main characteristics of Venetian construction is the portico, which is actually a central hall on the first floor, but usually at water level. The passengers get off the boats, and boats are unloaded here. Altana is also very typical, which is a wooden balcony above the roofs of the houses. Long ago, pirates and other criminals could be watched from here. Nowadays, at best the changes in weather and water level. Venice is still threatened by aqua alta, that is, high tide. At these times, we can only walk on footbridges, even on St. Mark's Square. Especially spring floods are dangerous, but the deeper-lying parts can be flooded any time between November and March. Each flood wave rarely lasts for more than three hours. People are warned by notices placed at the stops of water buses and the sirens sound in case of immediate danger. There was a market in the neighborhood of the crossing place here already in 1097, and active commerce takes place around here even today. Though the Pescaria, the new hall of the fish market, was built at the beginning of the 20th century, it matches the neighboring houses with its Gothic style and antique capitals depicting fish. 
This is where the fishermen return with the fresh catch every morning. Not only fish, but other creatures of the lagoons and open seas are sold here, such as crabs and octopuses. Besides housewives and landlords, the chefs of several family restaurants purchase their ingredients for lunch and supper here. Rivo Alto, High Bank. These two words were shortened to Rialto in the course of the centuries. Actually, its neighborhood, the easily defendable bank, was called like this where refugees of the lagoons established their first settlements. They built a pile bridge here that was replaced with a covered wooden bridge in 1180. Its builder was Niccolo Baratieri, who became famous for the pillars of San Marco. Carpaccio, a famous painter of those times, immortalized it on his painting that can be seen at the Accademia. The middle section of the bridge could be opened so that larger boats could pass underneath. Though the wooden bridge fell prey to Tiepolo's rebellion, it was restored in its original form and it served in this capacity for almost 200 years. Then the Great Council decided that the city was rich enough to build an outstanding stone bridge. This period abounded in artists to such an extent that we can encounter such names as Sansovino, Michelangelo, Scarpanino, and Palladio among the applicants. Anyway, they weren't the ones to complete the award-winning project, but Antonio Contini, the master builder of the Doge's Palace, who was from then on called De Ponte. The legs of the bridge rest on 12,000 elm piles. In the middle of the 44-meter long and 22-meter wide bridge, two arcades run. In the Middle Ages, a line of shops was built on almost every stone bridge, such as London Bridge. These lines of shops have remained virtually nowhere except here on the Rialto. The bridge itself was considered a real technical brilliance in its day. In fact, it was the only crossing place on the Canale Grande until 1854. The neighborhood of the Rialto was the commercial district of the city at all times, and still is. The exchange of the Venetian merchants inspiring Shakespeare used to be here, and this is the location of the stock exchange and the gold market under the arches of the Sorto Porchio di Rialto. Goldsmiths worked here in their small workshops, and Murano glass products were already being sold in those times. The market hall was rebuilt by Scarpagnino after the terrible fire in 1514. Mainly small souvenir shops can be found on the bridge itself, plus a vegetable and fish market at the foot of the bridge. The colorful picture of the market can be enjoyed at dawn, fresh mornings glittering like gold until the buyers carry the goods away. Italian markets have an ancient tradition. The account from Pietra Aretino from the 1500s could even have been written yesterday. Stepping to my window, I see thousands of people and countless barges. Businessmen crawl across the market. The barges, like cornucopias, carry the mass of fruits and vegetables. The Canal La Grande fills with all the products of the season at the crack of dawn. Carlo Goldoni made his mark in Italian and international literature with around 150 comedies. He was born in Venice in 1707. He worked as a lawyer in Chioggia, Padua, and Milan, but was really attracted to the theater. His pieces entitled Mirandolina, Squabbles in Chioggia, and others are billed frequently even today. His statue stands on the Campo San Bartolomeo in the hallway of the Rialto. Venice is unbearably hot in the summer, and it occurs that poorer farmers put a collection plate beside their dogs. In scorchers and after floods, when it's suggested to drink bottled drinking water, the small quantity of free water distributed by the city is not always enough to share with the dogs. The Contarini family is in possession of several palaces lining up along the Canal Grande. The building called Scala de Bovolo is known for its special twisted stairwell. The church on Campo San Salvador was once built by a colony of Germans living here. Dürer painted his famous rosary, which is now located in Prague, for this church. The design of the church was by Giorgio Spavento, and it was carried out by Tullio Lombardo with a Baroque facade by Giuseppe Sardi. The Telephone Company of Italy has an artist's foundation here on the square in a completely newly renovated Renaissance palace. The courtyard is surrounded by loggias and arcades with a fountain in the middle of the courtyard, a perfect location for Romeo and Juliet.
The Renaissance Palace of Scuola di San Marco could rightly be thought to be a church, even though it was built to be the clubhouse of the religious association. Recently, a division of the city hospital has begun operations in it, so it can't be visited inside. The paintings and statues that would have been worth to see were transferred to the building of the Accademia. The magnificent facade is the work of Pietro Lombardo. Novel is the first floor placed in an unusual architectural perspective. On the lunette by Bartolomeo Buon above the entrance, the nominal saint is shown. The lions of the token portal came from the workshop of Tullio Lombardo, while the artistic windows and colorful marble inlays are the creations of Mauro Coducci. The Venetians call San Giovanni a Paolo church by the nickname Zanipolo. It's the pendant to Frari, the other pantheon of the city. Twenty-five doges are buried here, and the funerals of the others have been held here since the 15th century. When the Grey Friars won Signoria to build the Frari, at the same time the Black Friars also asked for support to build their place of worship. Giovanni and Paolo, after whom it was named, were young Roman patricians who were beheaded by Emperor Apostata. The church founded in 1246 started to expand 200 years later and was finally sanctified in 1430. Numerous architects and sculptors worked on the building. The most famous was Pietro Lombardo, who was helped by his two sons, Tullio and Antonio. Bartolomeo Corleone served Venice as a mercenary warlord. He died in 1475, and in his last will, he left 100,000 ducats to the city with the stipulation that a statue of him be erected in front of San Marco. The Serenissima didn't want to waste the money, but he didn't want to see the statue of a mercenary when looking out the window of the Doge's palace, so it was erected in front of the Scuola di San Marco instead of the Chiesa. The Florentine Andrea Verrocchio created one of the most beautiful equestrian statues, not only of the Quattrocento, but of all times, perhaps portraying the archetype of warlords rather than Colleoni. After the master's death, the statue was cast in bronze and stood on a high marble pedestal. At the side of the Scuola, the Rio dei Mendicanti flows out into the open water. From here, Fondamenta Nuova Harbor, Boats depart toward San Michele, Murano, Burano, and Torcello. Summer winds barely furling the water of the dead canal, sailing on the airy clock swimming from one island to another. Sea of a hundred colors and purple clustered heaven, clusters of glass soaked in enchanted light, absorbed in radiant space, a long and fine wing flutters. This is the Isola San Michele Valenza Cemetery, only 500 meters from the Fondamenta, which is connected by a bridge on All Saints Day. Otherwise, it can only be visited by Vaporetto. On the way to Murano, it's worth it to get out and visit the peaceful cemetery with its majestic dark cypress trees. The island has only been a cemetery since 1813 and was up to that time a cloister. The sanctuary in the northwest corner of the city is one of the first Renaissance churches in Venice. Its facade was the first to be built of stone from Istria. Especially beautiful are the little Emiliana Chapel, the ambulatory, and the separate belfry. The whole island is surrounded by a high brick wall, which is only open toward the city, by a beautiful wrought iron gate. The island was in possession of the Camodolese order, famous for its educational activities. It was here that Francesco Mauro drew a map of the world 40 years before the discovery of America. This work is in the San Marco Library, the Libreria Vecchia today. Enviable is the city whose attractions can outshine such an extraordinary library, where pictures by Tiziano, Tintoretto, and Varonese adorn the walls. Among the approximately half-million volumes, many rare codices and first prints can be found. Numerous people who played an important role in the life of the city are buried here in the cemetery. Among others, writer Barokovu, 
English Consul James, composer Wolf Ferrari, poet Ezra Pound, Sergei Diaghilev, and Igor Stravinsky. The first settlements of Murano came from Altino, attempting to escape the invasion of the Bavarians. As early as the 10th century, the island received its independence from Venice, which is geographically only one kilometer away, but economically, the island has belonged to it since 1924. Venice was the first European center of glass industry to supply the West with polished mirrors, glass jewelry, and necklaces, but Marco Polo took the same products to the Far East. The glassworks produced several large fires in the city, so the works were relocated to the island of Murano in the 13th century. The importance of glasscraft is proven by measures of the Great Council, which allowed the skilled workers of the glassworks privileges unknown in other professions, such as six working hours a day, social benefits, and a pension. Moreover, the daughters of skilled workers could even marry patricians. In return, the workers weren't allowed to leave the territory of the Venetian Republic, and those who revealed the profession's best-kept secrets were sentenced to death. The island with 30,000 inhabitants and 300 works in its heyday prospered until the 16th century. By this time, cheap check glass and French mirrors toppled it from its market position. Only 7,500 inhabitants remained for the 20th century, and only a few works are in operation. In part of these factories, tourists are welcome and shown the process of glass production. Murano glass is sold in several places of Venice, but the widest variety is found along the main canal of Murano. We find everything that can be made of glass here, from glasses to ornaments to lamps and jewelry. We arrive at Murano, consisting of five small islands, at Port Colonna. Its main canal is Rio de Vitre. Abandoned glassworks, showrooms, and shops are found along it. The upper section of the canal is bordered by Gothic, Venetian-style houses. After the Palazzo de Cantarini comes the Museo Vitraio, which introduces glass objects from the oldest times up to today. There's a well and fragments of Dalmatian statues in its quaint courtyard. The name Ponte Santa Chiara reminds us of the friary which once stood here. There are still traces of Gothic or Renaissance style to be found in the houses, which were reconstructed in the 17th to the 19th centuries. The ceiling fresco of the pharmacy was done by Fontebasso. Mm -hmm. The wonderful Palazzo Trevisan is ascribed to Palladio, while the wall fresco is a work by Veronese. This is the only one which the master made for his own hometown. Palazzo Mula may be found where the Vivarini Bridge arches over the canal. The building is one of the few which demonstrates the splendor of the Murano of old. Mm -hmm. 
Ponta Bellari, in the center of the island, is the location of the Lion Column, where public summons were made. It used to be the marketplace of the island. A Gothic-style Dominican church is located on Ponte San Pietro Martire, complete with paintings by Bellini and Veronese. Is it any wonder that the travel guide featuring the paintings of Venice contains close to 3,000 pages? The only remains of an old church on Campo San Stefan is the belfry. A 19th century light tower on the coast still lights our way. Even in the day of satellite navigation, the towers around Venice still haven't gone out of style. They're still in operation today. At the foot of the tower, boats begin their way back to Venice, or in the other direction, to Burano and Torcello. Burano is a cute little fishing village with 6,000 inhabitants. The predecessors of the fishermen living here had to hang on hard and they didn't even leave their island when the stricken trailers of Torcello left their swampy city caused by the swamp fever. Those in Burano continued to live the difficult life of fishermen while their wives earned the bread and ruined their eyes with lace making. Just like glass products, lace was the big export article of Venice for centuries. Then, due to changes in fashion, this also faded away. At the end of the 19th century, the Italian queen opened a school for lace making in order to revive this old art, strengthened by the faint memories of the older generation. The Rio de Mezzo flows between the houses to the main street, the Via Baldassare Galuppi, which was named after the opera composer who was born here. In Burano, it's an old tradition for every house to be painted in a different color. The houses are quite simple, showing little trace of Gothic, Renaissance, or any luxury, but the cavalcade of the cheerful colors is attractive and gives Burano a fresh and colorful look. The houses are indeed quite extraordinary, with shades of dark burgundy, violet, deep blue, and wild green, while others are brilliant in their sunlit yellow, orange, purple, or sky blue. Even the fences and water towers are colorful, the effect heightened by flowers planted in pots or boxes. The main street ends at a square. This is where the San Martino Church stands, and opposite, the Lacemaker's School and Lace Museum. Especially those with their own boats and yachts will enjoy cruising the canals, but we can do the same with a rented boat. It's worth looking at the small islands of Torcello, San Francesco del Deserto, and San Giacomo in Palude for their unique atmosphere. In the Middle Ages, a few houses and an occasional monastery were here, scattered among several tiny islands. Boatsmen still sunbathe and lie on the beach at the foot of the ruins. The canals of Venice and surroundings totaled approximately 50 square kilometers. The water is shallow here. More than half of the territory is underwater only at the time of the spring floods, while others are constantly underwater, the so-called living canals. The name Lido was taken over by numerous resorts worldwide, 
but the first and original is this very long and very narrow island closing in the Venetian Gulf. It's not only an elegant resort, but also one of Venice's residential areas, amounting to around 18,000 residents. Though it can only be approached by boat, and some Renaissance villas and palaces are also found here, its atmosphere is basically different from that of the mother town. Not least because though the Lido area also has some canals, transportation is primarily carried out by cars and buses. The boats dock at Santa Maria Elisabetta Square, which was named after the church standing here. The High Dome Cathedral was built in 1627. The island is nearly 12 kilometers long and just 300 to 500 meters wide. The eastern bank, looking towards the Adriatic Sea, is one single sandy beach all along. There are public beaches and private riverside sectors as well. The more elegant hotels have their own beaches. Yacht docks and an airport built for private planes tell of the standard. Colorful striped canvas tents, rows of parasols, comfortable sun lounges and cabins fill the beaches. Soft drinks and ice cream are sold under the pavilions covered with palm leaves. There's no water sport that can't be done here. If we walk by in front of the more style luxury hotel, the Grand Hotel de Bain, we remember Thomas Mann's masterpiece, Death in Venice, which takes place here. The Lido has other older hotels besides the Grand Hotel. The seaside motorway leads to Quattro Fontane. Venice's casino and the Palazzo del Cinema can be found here, where the Venetian Film Festival is also held. The city center of Venice is just 20 minutes from the Lido by boat. San Giorgio Maggiore is one of the nicest buildings of the city of Canals. It stands in a perfect place at the end of the Canale Grande, opposite San Marco. The tiny island was endowed to the Benedictine order by Giovanni Morosini in 982. The monastery was built in 1223, then rebuilt 200 years later. Cosimo Medici lived here in exile at this time. The original church of the monastery was established in the 10th century. The recent building was designed by Palladio in 1565. His creation was finished by Andrea Pagliari after his death. The inner space is characteristic of the economy of pure architectural forms and ornament. Its peculiarity is the dome on the cross-shaped base and the long-stretching choir. On the west wall, the tomb of Galilee's friend, Doge Leonardo Dona, can be found. The group of statues on the main altar is the creation of Gerolamo Campagna. Part of the paintings were done by Tintoretto. The older wing of the monastery was designed by Palladio, the newer by Longhena. The belfry was built by Bernardo Baratti in 1774. Although the lift only takes us up to 60 meters, and it's not the piazzetta spreading in front of us, many think the view from here is nicer than from the San Marco Campanile. In the brilliant morning sunshine, we can see the greenish, oily smooth reflection with the patches of romantic islands, a distant mist in the background. To the east, the open waters of the Adriatic appear blue. Beyond Venice's tiled roofs, the cypress trees of the burial island, and the colorful houses of Murano and Burano. Since 1813, the two snow-white light towers of Istrian stone have been guarding over the harbor. The Giudecca Canal is three times as wide as the Canale Grande, allowing such ocean liners to pass, which would make the cupola of the St. George's Church seem like a dwarf. Giudecca Island protrudes into the South Canal like a long spine, which is why the locals call it Spinalunga. 
The name Judeca could refer equally to both convicts as to a Jewish colony. There are few cities in the world with a such well-documented history as Venice. However, we hardly know anything about Giudecca. Old etchings show noble palaces and large Renaissance ornamental gardens suitable for entertaining. Today, these are overgrown parks. The attraction of the island is the Lizitella Church, designed by Palladio and the luxurious Hotel Cipriani. In the direction of Ponte Olungo, we find boat repair workshops and the residential quarter of the local fishermen. The Gesuati Baroque Church is also known by the name Santa Maria del Rosario. This work of Masari was built in 1734 and is decorated with paintings and frescoes by Tiepolo. In February, temperatures decrease considerably, but Italy boasts blue skies even then. Carnival visitors ride past bare trees. Only the evergreens of Giardini Publici offer a fresh splash of color. The largest park of Venice was established by Napoleon in 1810 near the arsenal. Since 1104, the arsenal has been a famous and infamous builder and repairer of ships. In Venice's heyday, more than 16,000 people worked here on the 32-hectare territory. The hall located between the park and the arsenal is the location of the Venice Biennale. The arsenal itself is presently in possession of the army and as such cannot be visited except for their open house on November 4th. Did young people take their pleasure when the sea was warm in May? Balls and masks began at midnight, burning ever to midday. When they made up fresh adventures for the tomorrow, do you say? Was a lady, such a lady, cheeks so round and lips so red, on her neck the small face buoyant like a bellflower on its bed? The poet Robert Browning spent his last years in the Rezonico Palace, and he also died here. Perhaps he wouldn't resent it that the Museum of the Venetian Carnival was also set up here. The carnival, masked ball, and masquerade has a history of several centuries, but it has really been considered a tourist attraction since 1980. The week before Shrove Tuesday, an enormous amount of domestic and foreign guests joined the carnival in Venice. In this period, the city overflows with pleasure-seeking people wearing masks and costumes. Numerous theatrical and musical events take place on the streets and squares, too. The frivolity finishes with the palatial ball on Piazza San Marco. In order to decrease crowdedness, the City Council pronounced the whole period before Lent, Carnival, as of 1988. Therefore, it's easier for the guests to find hotel rooms, and the activities are also easier to join. At this time, even the city seems to put on a disguise. The well-known streets and squares also get a different image. Incoming people are all in costume, and they look fine in their wonderful fancy clothing. Like walking on a stage, where Verdi's A Masked Ball is just being performed.
Ezra Pound, resting in the cemetery of San Michele, expressed the common experience of all visitors to Venice. And the beauty of this, thy Venice, hast thou shown unto me, until is its loveliness become unto me a thing of tears.